Thank you all for staying. I, uh, I had a, uh, a moment of insecurity. I thought, well, they saw the word metrics, because this is what some of our veterinary students <laughs> look like when I talk to them about using numbers. So either everybody has left to go home, which would make me feel better, or they read the title and said, oh my god, i got to get out of here. So thank you very, very much for staying. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is when we're trying to control disease in populations, we have a tool bag of things, right? We use vaccination. We have to have good cleaning and disinfecting protocols. We have to uh, manage our populations through looking at length of stay, flow through planning, many of the things that you talked about with Dr. Newberry. And what I'd like to suggest to you and what I really want you to think very carefully about is how you can use the metrics as one more tool in that tool bag. And that's what I really want to spend some time, how you can do that. For those of you who are veterinarians, you know that your large animal clinics, you, or large animal clinician friends, use metrics. They look at somatic cell counts. They look at the rate of metritis. They look at days open. Because if you're dealing with a population, you have to think about how are you going to know if the population is healthy? How do you know that? How do you know if the recommendation that you made with regards to changing the vaccine protocol or changing the uh, cleaning protocol, how do you know it worked? How do you know it didn't get worse after your recommendation was implemented? Unless you begin to try to make greater use of the metrics that we're going to talk about, you don't really know. And so I'd like you to really seriously consider this and think about doing it when you get back home. And you don't need a really sophisticated program, really sophisticated software to do this. At least that's what I'm going to try to convince you of. So what I really like to do is talk about how you can, you know, some of these strategies that you can use the metrics to help you with. I'd like to share some examples that we have done where, in fact, using the metrics was really illustrative of some of the effectiveness of what we had, of changes in protocols we had implemented. I'd like to talk to you, because a lot of you have forgotten. How many of you are veterinarians? Almost all of you. How many of you are LVTs? Oh, good. So we've got some LVTs, too. LVTs or veterinarians, my suspicion is that when you had your course in epidemiology, you went, oh, all of you went, oh my god, why, what's the relevance of this? How can I possibly use this? And so I'm going to do a little bit of a review of looking at how to calculate some of the rates that I think are going to be helpful to you. And then we'll talk a little bit about data because garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so how do you know if a population is healthy? Is a population where one out of every three cats that walks through the door develops an upper respiratory tract infection, is that a healthy population? Would you rather have a population where less than one in every 10 cats that walks through the door develops URI? I hope so. <laughs> when animals are sick, they suffer. We know they suffer. And the mission or part of the mission of every shelter is or ought to be redu reduction of the suffering in animals. And if disease causes suffering, then we ought to be doing everything we can to reduce the level of disease at the population level. Obviously, when we do that, we reduce the number, number of individuals that are sick in the population. Um, the other question that Dr. Spindell just talked about is how do you know when an outbreak is happening? If you don't have parvovirus normally in your shelter and you now have three dogs with parvovirus, that hits you right up against, in the face, right? I mean, that, there's no question. You've got an outbreak. There's something going on that has changed the incidence of disease. URI, where you live with it day in and day out, isn't always that obvious. If you one in three get sick, and now you've jumped to one in, in uh, well, or 35%, 30% or 30 to 35%, you may not see that. If you're monitoring your rates, it can be a flag 
uh-oh, something's starting long before you get 50% of the cat sick or 70% of the cat sick or in the case of canine uh, respiratory disease complex, you went from a usual endemic level of kennel cough of 10%, now you've jumped up to, you're creeping up towards 15 and if you let it keep going, you may be at 20 or 30% when in fact you might have been able to intervene if on a regular basis you updated what the incidence of disease was. All right, so let's just do a poll of hands. Um, how many of you work in a shelter where you collect and computerize medical related data, and I mean any kind, vaccination, um, antibiotic treatment, et cetera? Good, so, so most of you are working in a shelter where you're using some kind of a computerized system. Computerized systems should make your lives easier to do what I'm gonna suggest. That said, I think there's no reason why, even in shelters where you don't necessarily have a computerized system, that you can't keep track of the number of cats or the number of dogs that develop particular illnesses that you're really, really interested in addressing. Um, data collection is both expensive and time consuming. And I really, really resist people collecting it for its own sake. We've got this data, we've got this database. Guess what? We can put in, you know, this about the animals and we can enter in all of this information. And how many of you work in a shelter where they're, they're inputting in massive amounts of information and using only a incredibly small proportion of that information. It's, it's human nature, we have this thing, we gotta get the data in. But my, I would like to suggest to you that the more data you collect, the more likely the quality and the completeness of the data that you collect declines. That as the amount of it goes up, the quality and completeness can go down. And that's because people begin to say, this is just a busy work, they've got me sitting here, I wanna go home, entering this data. What a pain. Rather, I'd rather, much rather have you enter small amounts of data that you're going to, um, that influences your thinking and your actions. Why am I putting this in the computer? What do I intend to do with it? Now, it may be that you have different purposes, and we'll talk about that, looking at it serving and facilitating individual animal health, versus facilitating population level health. Um, again, plea, if you're gonna put data in, if you're going to go to the time and effort and pay a staff member or yourselves do it, then put it in accurately and put it in completely or as complete as you can. You don't want 50% missing information because then the question always is, how does the missing information differ from the information that I have. So, how many of you use your computer, those of you who said yes, that you have computerized medical data, how many of you use that data for individual animal care? You may schedule, you've vaccinated and now you schedule a reminder that says we need to revaccinate two weeks from today on this animal. How many of you are individual? Good, 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 good. So most of you. Um, so for individual animal care, you're gonna use that medical care, uh, that, that database oftentimes for scheduling vaccinations, surgeries, wormings. You, keep, you may well keep all of your medical record now in the computer so you know what has been done with this animal, what has happened, what is the history on this animal. Um, and uh, you may be wanting to see, make sure that the dose that, you're, that you recommend that the medical staff give to an animal is in fact being entered accurately and it's being that they're actually adhering to your protocol. Okay, good. So do you also use your computerized medical data, for those of you who, who do it, do you also use it to monitor the health of your population level? How many of you do that? That doesn't surprise me and that's why I'm here. That's what I want to encourage you to begin to, to, to think about. So disease surveillance, trends, are you, are you getting, is the uh, level or frequency of disease in your shelter going up, going down, 
remaining static. Um, outbreaks. How do you know if you have an outbreak, especially for an endemic kind of disease that's usually around, how do you know if you have an outbreak if you don't know what the usual level is, especially as it begins to creep up? And as Dr. Spindell said, an early flag is, geez, it's begun to go up. Now, you know, this week we are two percentage higher than last. Next week we're four percentages high. Boy, something's going on here long before you have half the shelter that's sick and, you, and it hits you in the face and says, well, boy, I got a problem. Um, and then just to know how much disease do you have in the shelter? What's the probability that an animal under your care will get sick? You should know that. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about setting health goals, health-related goals. We, shelters often set goals. They set goals for a capital campaign. They set goals for increasing the number of spay-neuters or to develop a new spay-neuter program in the community. But how often do we actually set health-related goals at the population level? Um, and then we want to be able to monitor. Once we've set goals and set a plan in place, how do we know it worked? How do we, how do we know it was effective? And God forbid it made things worse. Um, so we need to be able to monitor those things as well. And then there are a lot of other reasons. And the more you use your data, and, and I know I'm an epidemiologist and I like numbers and all, but I, I'm hoping to convince you that you get excited that one, looking at some data, leads to another question. And you go, well, why is it that our kitten respiratory rate is so much higher than in our adult cats? Uh, OK, we have a one and a half times higher rate of um, canine respiratory complex in our owner surrendered dogs than in our strays. Why is that happening? Why, what, what's, What's going on? Is it something to do with the ward, something to do with the management, something to do with the staff that care for those animals? It raises questions that lead then to other questions. And I think that's the exciting part. It's not the numbers themselves that are exciting, but the, but the, the things you can learn from using the data. OK, I think there are a lot of other reasons. I think you can use it to motivate staff. Hey, did you know, those of you who are cleaning cages and handling animals, that we have this very high risk of our cats getting sick. You guys are the first line of defense. We have set the goal to reduce that this year by 5%, and we need your help as a team to do this. And we're going to come together, make a plan together, monitor how we're doing, and then if you, in fact, are effective, you can celebrate that. Celebrate it with everybody. We need a team. Health, animal health in shelters results as a con is, is a consequence of teamwork. It, that teamwork, if it's not good, can result in high rates of disease. If that teamwork is good and people are all on the same page and they're working toward the same end, you can have very good results. You know, upper respiratory tract disease in either dogs or cats, we're not going to eliminate that for lots of reasons that you guys well know. But we can minimize it. It is not just a fact of life that you have to live with a lot of respiratory disease. You're going to have to live with some, but let's minimize that. Let's strive to make that the lowest possible proportion of animals coming into our shelters as possible that we can. Um, knowing how many animals you have to take care for it helps to order uh, medical supplies. Um, justification, a lot of our Funding agencies are now asking for data. They want to know, how are you doing? And, and similarly, if you're going to your board and, you're, and the board is faced with, OK, do we put new siding on the building? Or do we invest our resources in reducing the amount of disease in our dogs or cats? And you've got data to show them that, wow, look, at, this is way unacceptable. We have 30% of our cats getting sick in our care or 20% of our dogs walking through the door get canine respiratory disease complex. That's not acceptable. These animals are suffering. We're, we're an organization that's not about suffering. We're about alleviating suffering. And if we can do something about minimizing that suffering, by gosh, that's part of our mission. 
We can't be part of the problem that we're trying to address in the community. So I think these things can be very persuasive. Um, just to kind of draw your attention back to your days in veterinary school, remember that one of the ways, the ways that we really monitor the health of a population is through incidence rates, prevalence rates secondarily, but we have to under, be able to quantify how much disease is going on in the population. Now that doesn't necessarily always include all of the population, it could be subsets of the population by location, by host characteristics, are our pit bulls suffering more behavioral problems than our, than our non-pit bull animals? And then that helps us to direct our resources and to concentrate where we're going to put our efforts. Because we have limited resources, we ought to be using them most effectively. And then once we have, a, have questions and once we know where the highest rates are, that helps us to then say, OK, why is that? What can, and then that leads to what can we do about it? And then you have to stop and plan, don't you? You have to stop and say, how can I lower the amount of disease in the shelter? What's my plan? And then hopefully once you have a plan and you have set goals, you can then monitor your progress towards achieving the goals that you have. All right. So, we said before, if you have an outbreak, you ought to know what your usual level of disease is in the population because an outbreak by definition is an increased incidence of disease above that which is usually seen in your population. Um, just a quick reminder, when you talk about incidence measures, they are measuring the risk of developing disease in the population, of getting sick. When you're talking about prevalence measures, you're talking about how many animals, usually at one point in time, that have disease. Regardless of whether they came in with a disease, whether they developed it yesterday, whether they developed it two weeks ago, if they have disease at the point that you do the measurement, it's a prevalence estimate. Most often, we are interested in incidence measures because we're interested in the probabilities that the animals that come into our care get sick. Yes, we do want to treat those that come in already sick, obviously. But if we can prevent them from getting sick, that's under our control. That's, we have an influence on keeping those animals healthy. So in this example, if we look, this is in a shelter, and this is just a, picked out some diseases that were diagnosed. Now, obviously, you can only, these are diagnosed cases. You're going to miss cases, right? We, we, uh, Dr. Spindell talked about subclinical cases. There are lots of subclinical cases. It's not practical to go in, at least, although I love the idea of monitoring over time what the prevalence of infection is periodically. Uh, but for most of us, we're, we're mostly, if, we're, if we start actually monitoring, collecting information on clinical disease, I think we'll be a, way ahead of the game. Then we can move into looking at infection rates uh, later in time. But, um, here, the, these, this is the incidence of coccidia, the incidence of the newly diagnosed cases in this shelter. Is it possible some of these came in with coccidia? Yeah, it is. It's possible. But these were first diagnosed, so these are new cases over all cats that came in. When you start talking about, so the, all of these are incidence measures, and the, probably the one that, that most of us focus most on because it's such a vexing issue is our, our respiratory diseases. Um, when you start looking at when you, when at entry, what was the prevalence of heartworm? What, what proportion of dogs that we brought into our shelter last year had heartworm? Then you're looking at things like heartworm prevalence, the prevalence of sarcoptic mange at entry, uh, the prevalence of feline leukemia at, at the time that you test them, the prevalence of FIV at the time you test them. So, I've done that. So, disease surveillance. So, you now have some kind of baseline measure. You have some kind of, of an idea of what usually happens in your shelter. And so, now we can watch over time. We can watch, well, how does this compare? How does the incidence of upper respiratory disease in the summertime compare to in the wintertime in your shelter? How much less disease or how much more disease? do you see 
in the winter, for example. Um, we already talked about disease outbreaks, and now you can communicate with your board about the level of disease. We've already talked about that as well. All right, so we can look at trends over time. And you're using these data to answer your questions. Now, the data may suggest other questions, but so often people want to know, well, you know, uh, what should I do? What question should I ask? That's a question you, you need to ask. You're going to ask the questions. And the, and the statistics or the metrics are tools. They are the tools to help you answer your questions or to gain insight into the questions that you have. Um, so let's just take the example of looking at prevalence estimates. And so here, in this shelter in 2010, 1,138 cats were tested for FELV. Of those, 34 were positive at intake. In 2011, 33 out of 1,193 tested positive. And one could ask the question, is the prevalence of FELV going down in the community such that you get a lower rate? And not that you can control that, but at what point do we stop testing for FELV or FIV, or do we? If we're down, let's say we're down around 1%, do we continue to use resources to test? Now, obviously, that's going to depend on communal housing, on, on resources, on your comfort level with telling people that this animal hasn't been tested, but we know in the community that we only see 1% of cats and we choose to use our resources differently? And I'm not answering the question for you, I'm just asking the question. Because we've been driving down the prevalence in our communities of FELV. It used to be around 5%, it's now around 2% in most communities across the country. At what, level, what, at what point is it so uncommon that we don't test for it anymore? If you don't know the answer to this, then you have a problem. So I just wanted to show you, I mean, what you need now is how many tests are run and then how many of those were positive. In PetPoint, you can pull that out through your reports. I'm, I'm most familiar with PetPoint because that's the shelters that we are working with, but check with your shelters. Could you do this by hand? Yeah, you could. I mean, every time you get a positive cat, you, you make a tick mark and put the date. Tick mark, date. You have intake data. The shelters collect intake data. They have to do that for board purposes, keep the board informed, for reporting purposes, whatever. So now, depends on, of course, are you testing all of the cats with FELV? But again, you could do tested result, tested result. You could do that in Excel. You could do it in a notebook, OK? Not hard to do. So here, in this case, of course, it hasn't changed. And I wouldn't expect it to change in a year in any case. But if, let's say you have now 15 years worth of data, and you're, in your community it's gone from 4% down to 0.5%, which I think is not un, an unrealistic thing to expect maybe in the next 10 years with FELV. Um, so then you can decide, are we going to continue to test? What are the pros and cons of that? All right. More importantly, I think, for most of us is the incidence. What's the incidence of disease? What's the probability that if a cat walks through the door, if a dog walks through the door, that they are going to get sick in our care? And so here, it gets a little trickier to get incidence data, uh, because now in the numerator, what we want is newly diagnosed ca cases. So if you guys all are sitting here without a cold, and at the end, now we start watching you for 30 days, and then count the people in here that get sick during that 30-day period. That's the numerator. Okay. Um, and then the question then is, who's at risk of developing URI? Who? And in 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 this room, my guess is that we are all at risk of developing a cold unless we were going to isolate ourselves and, you know, and put ourselves in a bubble or something. Okay? All right, so how do we do that in the shelter? And what do we have to think about? Um, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, and remember, always incidence rates are in some time frame, because it's the probability of getting sick in some interval. 
Could be a month, could be a year, could be in the next six months, could be in a season. It's for you to define what do you want to do. I think you don't want to get down too much, especially when you're getting started, too much more fine than a month. At least that's where I'd start. What's your monthly incidence rate of upper respiratory? You could do it by season. You could say, I'm going to start with the season. And what's my seasonal rate of URI? Um, now, the numerator, we already said, was the first time. The, the, the denominator, that population at risk. And I want you to stop and think for a moment. Now, who, who's in your shelter, of those that all come into your intake, who's at risk of developing URI? Well, certainly cats that are owner surrendered stay in the shelter. Stray cats, yes. Adoption returns, yeah, and they're probably at risk. Uh, cats transferred in, they're going to spend some time. Um, seizures, you could treat them separately or if you want to do it crudely initially because seizures is going to change things, right? Last month or last season you, you didn't have any seizures. This season, same season next year, you have 100 cats come in from a seizure. That could raise your rates of upper respiratory considerably and it's not your fault. You actually did a good thing. You, so, you, you took and helped those animals. So you may want to watch your seizures because they may, if, they're, if you get some big seizures, they could influence your risk and make the comparability of one year to the next different. So you've got to have your thinking cap on when you do this. And then for some, depending on how you're using PetPoint or any of your software, you may be logging in things like service in or clinic in, especially if you're, doing, if you're using your clinic in category to also count your spay neuters or your TNRs that come in, get done, and go out. They probably ought not to be in your denominator because they're not in your shelter. They're, not, they're coming in, having surgery, and going back out. It's not like you're gonna they're going to develop URI under your watch. Okay, so my point being here is you do need to know something about your software and what gets counted in the intake. Or you need to get your reports brought out such that you can separate these and actually exclude them. So you only add up owner surrendered cats, stray cats, adoption returns, cancerous, uh, cats transferred in, and then you've got to make a decision about whether you're going to keep the seizures in or not. And then you're going to look at that as your population at risk during that interval. Does that make sense? Do you all understand what I'm saying there? I mean, it really is the question of who's, who you're asking about and who does it make sense to leave in that denominator. So this is a little bit more problematic than our, that are just looking at our prevalence measures for uh, FELV. All right. So I've, we've already talked about that service in category. So, um, so let's think about who else? So obviously animals coming into your shelter will now be at risk in those categories. And among those that came in, those that were already sick with an upper respiratory tract are no longer at risk. So usually we don't have a lot of those. Usually in most shelters that I've looked at, it's somewhere 5% or less of animals actually entering with URI. But if you can pull those out, that would be ideal because they're no longer at risk of getting sick. Do some cats develop second, second or another bout of URI? Yeah, but in fact, it's a very small percentage of, it, of the cats coming in, one. And secondly, I hope your length of stay is such that they don't have time to have a second URI. If you're working in a sanctuary or whatever, then you may want to pay a little bit more attention to that. But in most cases, I think I, would, I wouldn't really worry about second being at risk of a second event. If they have an event of URI, pull them out. They are no longer at risk in that interval. Okay? Um, and you can, uh, and, and then the other thing is at the beginning of the interval, let's say you wanted to look at July, August, and September, and, that, and the risk of developing URI in that interval. On July 1, you have animals in the shelter. You don't start off with nobody in the shelter. Somebody's there already. And so those animals 
are at risk. They ought to be added to your denominator so long as they're not in the infirmary and already have URI. And it may be trivial. If you're looking at a year, then probably the number of animals that you have on hand on January 1, let's say, might, is a, such a small fraction of the total intake that isn't going to make much difference to your rate. But the shorter you make the interval, the more weight it will have, and you don't want to leave them out. Does that make sense? Do you all understand kind of what I'm saying? OK. All right. So um, again, still in, if they're still in the shelter, those that had URI, if you have this information, we happen to be working with, with Tompkins County right now, and we have information for a long time. We actually pulled out cats that had URI in actual, at the, the previous year. So they recovered on the 25th of December, and they were still in the shelter, and I didn't want to leave them in the denominator. But you can drive yourself nuts with this. You can get finer and finer and finer. So just pull out the biggies, OK? I don't want to drive you. Uh, somebody's always asked me that question. Well, shouldn't we pull those out? Well, yeah, if you can. But I don't, I don't want to make it so complicated you don't do it, because I think you can still get really good information about the probabilities of your cats getting sick or your dogs getting sick without paying attention to every possible category that you might want to pull out, because they get finer and finer, and they make really no, no large difference. OK. Um, all right, we already talked about that. So let's take an example. Let's just, it's, it's easier, I think, sometimes to see an example. So here's a, a shelter with 1,580 cats walking through the door in 2010, 1,521 in 2011. Uh, Still in shelter on 1-1 one, one of 2010. This was a shelter. I'll show you some other data that really had a problem with length of stay. And we had a lot of cats in the shelter at that, in that particular year. But there were 216 of those cats still in shelter on 1-1. One, one. 14 of them were sick on 1-1, one, one, actually in the infirmary. And then we happened to know in this shelter that 26 that were still there on January 1 had been sick the previous year. Okay. Um, this year, these number of cats had URI. Of those, 60 had entered with URI. And these were newly diagnosed cases of URI in that year, in 2010. Uh, and the same kinds of numbers there. All right. So we took that 1580 that, and re removed the 60 that actually entered with URI. Similarly, we did that for 2011. And um, so we had 216 in the shelter on 1-1, one, one, but 26 had URI in the previous year, and 14 were currently sick. So we took them out of that to get 176 cats uh, that were at risk on, on January 1. Now, there are 1580 that enter the shelter, 60 came in sick, so that makes 1520 that were at risk. Add those two together to get 1696 that in that interval were, to, to the best of our knowledge, susceptible to getting sick in the shelter. Okay? And then we repeated the process for 2011. Any questions on that? I mean, you're essentially just pulling out animals that had been sick before that interval began, because they're not at risk of getting sick. They, now, the ones that get sick during the interval have to remain in the denominator, right? Because it's a proportion of those animals that were at risk that got sick. So if two of you were to get a cold in the next month, that it would be two out of the total of you that are currently in the room. It's just a, it's a probability estimate. Okay. I know people hate that word. Um, OK. So we repeat the process. And in this particular shelter, things hadn't changed. Some of this was hypo I took some real numbers, and then I did some hypothetical things. But this, in this, you'd compare the two and say, geez, we haven't affected any change here. Or it's been fairly stable if you hadn't even tried to affect some changes. And those rates are pretty low for a lot of shelters. A lot of the shelters that we're looking at, <laughs> uh, we had one that was up to 30% of their cats walking through the door got URI. I was talking with a young woman earlier today who had a shelter that had 100% of their cats were, had URI, had some horrible, horrible uh, overcrowding issues, and 
huge lengths of stay, just a massive lengths of stay. So, I mean, they, it can get really bad, but you ought not to be there. You pr probably were striving to be, uh, and I'll probably eat these words because I think I need more shelters to look at, but I think we're probably looking at, at shelters. I've seen a shelter as low as 7% of cats walking through their door get URI, which is really amazing to me. But it's not, it's, not, it's not your shelter in comparison to other shelters. It's your comparison this year compared to last year, or this spring compared to last spring. You want, you want to affect improvement in your shelter. That's what's, what's crucial. OK. Um, and, and then you, know, you can get, again, you can start pulling out all kinds of things. If they come in for a day, are they really at risk of developing URI? No, probably not. Again, most often, many shelters, that's a very small, if it's a really big proportion of your, in your shelter, then you better pull them out of the, of the denominator. But it gets, once you start getting all these, pulling out all these animals, it gets harder and harder to get the data <laughs> to do that, even with the software. Okay. Um, this I'm just going to mention, and I'm going to fly through it because I don't want you to concentrate on it. This, may, this is for anybody in the audience who might have a little bit more knowledge about epidemiology. The problem with using straight probabilities is that, that when, ca when cats come and go or dogs come and go, they have different lengths of stay. It's not like you started off and we followed all of you for the entire month and so let's say there are 50 of you in here and two of you get sick. And at the end of the interval, I know what happened to all 50 of you. Okay? And you all were followed for an entire month. In our shelters, what happens? They come in, they go out. Some stay for five days, some stay for 10 days, some stay for 30 days. And so their length of exposure varies. And technically, we ought to be doing care days, the number of sick animals divided by the care days. Um, we have done a little work to look at that, uh, and that's called incidence density when you have care days in the denominator. And if you look here, the patterns based on straight, what we call cumulative incidence or the straight probabilities, look almost identical here to the month, monthly incidence density rates. And we've got some more work to do with this, some more research to do with this. But so far, it looks like you're not going to be way off by just ignoring those care day, the differences in care days, and instead concentrating on just looking at the straight proportion of animals that get sick. Now, this is a, was a research project that we did where we actually did both. We calculated both the percentage and the rate per 100 days in the shelter. And what you'll see is if we just look at individual kittens versus cats over seven months of age, these were incidentally those anything six months or less. And here it looks like our individual kittens have a lower risk than the adults for becoming, and, 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 it, and it is true that a lower proportion of them got sick. What, if you lose the care days at risk, these guys were in the shelter a much shorter period of time because kittens come in and go out a lot, lot faster but they get sick more quickly. They get, in the, in the number of days that they get sick, they get sick, if they're going to get sick, they get more sick faster. And so the absolute you know, incidence density rates shows that kittens really are going to get sick faster in the shelter than your adults. This is more of a research level. I think we're still fine that, that we just stick with looking at the proportion of animals that get sick until we better understand where, where exactly that really isn't true. Um, this is just to show you that what, this is the kind of thing that you can begin to look at. It, this is uh, upper respiratory rate by age. Uh, I don't like these particular categories of juvenile and adult. What do they mean? We'll come to that in a little bit. But that gives you a sense of, well, geez, here um, our uh, adult cats actually for most of the year, have a higher risk of URI than our juvenile animals, and those are six months of age or less. Is that true in all shelters? I don't know. That's what we need. But, but it's true in you. If you're doing it for your own shelter, it's true in your shelter. And does that remain constant? 
or do we have a real problem this year in our adults? And normally it, it doesn't run that way. In fact, it's much lower because now you have the data from last year and the year before that to compare it to. Okay? But that's the kind of thing you can do. Incidentally, this was done in Excel. And if you yourself can't do Excel, your kids can. <laughs> or your neighbor's kids can. And this is really not rocket science. This is really easy to do in Excel. It is not hard. And so there's no reason that if you yourself can't do it, that you don't have a staff member to, to do it or, or somebody's kid to do it for you. Um, this is not hard. You need to get the data out and give them the data and they can make the graphs for you. Uh, this is by season. And you begin to find some kind of interesting things. Um, you know, we all think we have much more respiratory disease during the kitten season, during the summer months. Do we have absolutely more numbers? Yeah, we do. We have more cats that are sick. Guess what? We have a lot more coming in, too. So that when you do the straight percentages, in fact, the rates are lower in the, summer, the summertime, and this, at least in this shelter, than they are in the fall or in the winter. You begin to see things and to realize things, and, and, and it challenges many times your misconceptions about what's really happening. Because if you only counted without a denominator, it looks like, yeah, you do have more, di more diseased cats by number, but the rate, the, ra the, the, the risk of developing disease is actually lower. Uh, this is one where we have a shelter where we've been working to lower the respiratory rate. And so this is 1, 2010 up to 6, 2011. We now have some other data. But in fact, you can see here, now beware, sometimes these very short snapshots can be misleading because things bounce. There's variability. Um, but, and that's why you want to do this on a consistent basis so that you can follow it. Um, identify and investigate outbreaks. Uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I've already mentioned that some outbreaks hit you right in the face and you don't really need to anything uh, to really uh, to really say, hey, I've got a way higher incidence than I usually do. This is a very quick uh, example of a, of a situation where a veterinarian called me and said, you know what, I think that my, spay, my spays, I'm getting a much higher incidence of spay infections uh, than I have ever seen. And I'm worried about it. And I've tried, I've looked, I've tried to figure out what's going on, and I don't know why. And I'm not even absolutely sure it's true, but boy, it sure seems like it. He's a very astute veterinarian, very much in tune with what's going on in his shelter. And so he said, do I have an outbreak going on? And if so, can you help me? I've got to figure out what's going on, what's happening in my shelter. I can't, if things I've looked at are just not obvious. So we looked at the rates. So here's 2007. These are the rates by month. This is January, February, sorry, this is not labeled well. Uh, but look, does he have an outbreak going on here? Yeah, look at, look at 2008. I don't, I don't even need a statistical test here. I'm not, uh, you know, all I want to look at is, is it, is, it, is it consistently higher? And now look, he told me, he said, oh, geez, I think 20% of my cats, I'm so worried. What he, what he was seeing was all, uh, of course, all he could see was the cats with infections. When we actually looked at the rates, they were fairly low. I mean, he runs fairly low, usually. But, in fact, he was now up around, in some, in some months, up as high as 4% or almost 4.5%. And he said, I know. And he was right. He had an outbreak going on. You have to be pretty astute to catch an outbreak that goes from like, you know, 0.5% up to 4%. That, that's a hard outbreak to see, but man, he, he was on that. Um, so we looked at the rates over time. I just want to show you, you can break them down and look. And I'm calling these attack rates in the, in the context of an outbreak, an incidence rate just by definition is called an attack rate, but it's exactly the same thing as that cumulative incidence rate that we were talking about before, okay? And um, this is just a little background. They handle about 10,000 cats. It's an open admission shelter. They have about two and, th and three quarter, <laughs> or three out of four, uh, two and three quarter veterinary full-time equivalents, sorry, seven LVTs. They perform about 3,400 cat space per year. Um, and so we began to look for, well, what's going on here? So was there, you know, are, 
and they do pediatric uh, spays. So the question was, are the peds accounting for this? So we looked at median age at surgery, no real difference there. We looked at median days to surgery, had they stayed in the shelter longer, uh, you know, thought maybe they got, the skin was somehow contaminated and, and we didn't clean it as well or something, no real difference there. And, and these aren't all the things we looked at, but I just wanted to show you a kind of what you could do with the data. And they had three surgeons and they all went gulp, but they said, look at our rates by surgeon. And while this was a little concerning to our, our surgeon number two, but in fact, these are not statistically different from one another, although I think it made her a little bit nervous and, and, and she needs now to look at her, you know, at her uh, protocols. Um, and we, we looked at this by technician uh, because there had been some turnover in technicians. And we didn't really see anything. It wasn't statistically different. And then I got a call from him. He'd been thinking, he looked at these data and he'd been thinking. And he called me back and he said, you know what? I looked at those data and I began to think about when we had hired. And lo and behold, they had a bunch of, they had several LBTs leave in a very short time. And they had hired um, very recently four new LBTs. And he said, take a look at the attack rates by when they were hired. And Lo and behold, we've got probably about almost a three times higher rate in our recent hires. So he went back and he reviewed with them the uh, surgical prep and all of the handling procedures. And we don't know, we ne you almost never know for sure, but once he did that, he brought the rates right back down. And I use it to, to just to illustrate to you that these data really have usefulness to you guys, I think. And that, you know, maybe you don't have a situation like this, I hope you don't, but other kinds of outbreaks where maybe the reason for it, it isn't just the introduction of a new dog coming from the outside that brings in canine distemper, that it may be some other things going on. Okay. All right. So. Looking at just the, the disease burden, and here's some ideas for you. I mean, I used incidence rates because that's what, what's most commonly used. But, you know, could you look at the average daily census in your infirmary? Yeah, you could monitor that over time. How's my infirmary doing this year compared to last year or this season compared to last season? Be creative. There's no right or wrong here. You're looking for metrics that help you, that help you to better understand what's going on. Um, Average day, you know, if you're thinking about money, how much, how many care days are you now, of all the care days you do each year in your shelter, what proportion of those are devoted to caring for sick animals? That's a, that can be an eye opener to your board, maybe an eye opener to you and your medical staff too. So, you know, there's no one metric. I love incidents because it really gives you the probability of getting sick and you can talk to people about that, but there are other ways that you can think about using these data to help look at the impact of disease, not only on the suffering of individual animals, but on the impact to the facility, to the shelter itself and its use of resources. Um, and then really, really, really think about setting goals. Um, and you know there are all kinds of reasons to set goals. But, and you can look, these will be available to you. Uh, and I won't go through all of these because time is getting a little bit short. Um, but I think that if we don't set goals, if we don't say, I really want to reduce the incidence of disease by 5% this year, and, and then stick to that, develop a plan to do that. What am I gonna, what's the most important things I have to do to reduce the upper respiratory tract infection in my cats? Is it length of stay? Do you think that, that if you really worked on length of stay, that you could, you could lower that? Is it overcrowding? And, and coming back within your capacity, your physical and um, care capacity, are you so high above that, that that's really impacting on your disease rates? Maybe it's your cleaning protocols. Maybe it's staff training. Think about what's m likely to be most effective. And I would keep that to one or two things because if you start trying to change everything at once, what often happens is that you don't, you don't do a good job at any one of those things. Just some thoughts for you. <laughs>
okay? And make those goals specific. Here's an, incident, uh, an example uh, that Dr. Berliner worked on. We had a shelter that had a median length of stay of 33 days. That means that half of the cats stayed 33 days or longer, half of them stayed 33 days or less. Okay? That's long. This is, a, this, is a, this is not a sanctuary. This is a shelter that's, a, that's pushing animals through. So um, several protocols that, that Dr. Berliner talked about a little earlier uh, in that session. So you're going to talk a little bit about, no, not here, OK. Well, working on strategies to reduce length of stay was, was what she really worked at. And we were able in a year, she was able in a year, to drop that from 33 days to a median of 25 days. Look what happened to the, cent the average daily census in this shelter. It went from 193 down to 119. And even though it wasn't necessarily an explicit goal, look what happened to our URI rates in this shelter. 2010, 2011. Reduction in overcrowding, reduction in length of stay. And you can show that to people. You can show it to your staff. Celebrate that. Wow, look what, what a wonderful job you guys did. We all got together and we lowered length of stay. And not only that, but look at you got, then right now they have many fewer animals in the shelter. And they're going, it's so noticeable. Where are our cats? They're all gone. Where are they? Well, they were there. They just stayed a lot less time, just like Dr. Spindell was showing you. So, uh, not with cats, but with dogs. Okay. Um, so many other questions that you can ask. Who are the high-risk groups? How do your seniors do? We, in a study that we, uh, we did some years ago, cats that were eight years and older had a higher rate of respiratory tract infections. And then when you looked at how long it took them to recover, they had prolonged recovery times. Not surprisingly, but we actually had data to, to, to demonstrate that. Um, looking at things by age. Um, other things, these are just ideas. You, you guys can be creative and think about all the things that you could learn from the data instead of, oh my God, I gotta work with the data. I think you can get excited about it. I hope you can. Um, so some, I, just some very quick insights. Of course, garbage in, garbage out. You gotta have good data to do this. And you gotta be able to get the data back out and that's not always easy. I, I absolutely admit that. And we're working on that. We're trying to make it a lot easier. The goal is 10 years from now, maybe less, you can push a button and, and your pet point will give you some of these graphs. Or you push two buttons and you get the graph, OK? Um, but you know, have clear definitions of age. Age is a great one. You know, oh, kitten, juvenile, adult, senior. What does that mean? We all would have somewhat different idea. And, and think about your lay staff at the, at the front desk that enters that data. Give them some guidelines. Put, you know, if it's um, four months or less, it's a kitten. We'll call that, if you want to use the word kitten, I, you, or you can just use the, the range. But actually put it there explicitly so that they know what the definitions are. Um, you got to know something about your software, because you got to know what goes into the intake and what you can pull in and pull out. So it's going to take a little time to get to know the software, perhaps a little better than you already know it. I know a lot of you know how to get the medical data in, or you have gnashed teeth over getting the medical data in. But you also have to know something about how the data, in, the intake data, because you've got to get that population at risk in there. Um, so specify your questions very carefully. Do you want to include fosters, not include fosters? Do you want to take in, uh, to include seizures, not include seizures? Um, this is another thing. Keep a log of changes that happen. If you, uh, I'll give you a really, really dramatic one, but if you went from uh, an open admission to a no-kill and you're, you're tracking your live release rate, well, guess what? Um, your live release rate is going to go skyrocket. Your, your uh, euthanasia rate is going to drop. But the silly thing is, is that we have a lot of tra tra turnover in our shelters and the historical memory of what transpired in the shelter often goes with the people that had been working there. And now you just start and you go, well, what, what went on? You know, 10 years ago, what went on? What, what, what was going on there? Um, and so changes that in protocols that could affect disease, document them. 
Put them in a little log where you make a change to cleaning. You went to a new disinfectant. What date did you start your new disinfectant? What new protocol did you introduce in, in January of last year? Because you want to interpret the data too, right? You're not just putting the data in. You want to use it and be able to interpret it appropriately. Um, you know, anything that changes that could affect the rate of disease or the health of the animals in the population. Um, and, and stop and think. Now this takes some time. If you're goal setting for, you've got to stop and think about it. And get people, more people than just the veterinarian. I think you ought to do it with the LVT, with the medical staff, and even involve some of the regular staff, because they, they know actually what's actually happening on the floor, okay? And then accuracy and completeness, we've already talked about that. And I really, my, my closing message is, I really strongly encourage yourself, encourage you to really look at the data. Take a look at it. Start counting some of these cases. Um, it can, you could take a notebook and count all the cases that come in this month or the rest of this month of you, uh, that develop URI. Um, and then you can start exploring at the same time well, geez, you know, how, how do I get this intake data out of PetPoint or Chameleon or whatever, that, uh, whatever software you're using? Okay, so just going back, I mean, we're about minimizing suffering. And I think we should be using all the tools we possibly can to minimize disease. And I think that goal setting and monitoring metrics is one more tool that can help you and the shelter minimize the amount of disease. And, and therefore minimize the amount of suffering that's going on in there. So it's my opinion, but the data will help you do that. Okay? Thank you to the Maddie's Fund as always. We wouldn't exist were it not for the Maddie's Fund. Uh, thank you for the ASPCA for putting on this conference. Thank you all for you sharing your two days with us because we learn from you folks as much as you learn from us. And then thank you to my colleagues, Dr. Berliner and others of us in the program and all of the shelters that allowed us to use the data in this, uh, in this presentation.